so that people can see the screen a little bit better. Delighted to be here today uh, when uh, Tracy uh, called me, I think it was last May or June or July, to see if I would do this. I was delighted to uh, do it. Great environmental law energy program uh, here at Houston. Uh, it also struck me as a particularly fitting place to come and talk uh, about, the, about the Gulf oil spill. As far as the one o'clock class goes, uh, just like Occupy Wall Street, you know, we'll be here as long as we want to be here. No, one, no one's going to stop us. Uh, all right. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is my recent service as Executive Director of the President's uh, Oil Spill Commission, uh, which was charged with investigating the Gulf oil spill. I'm going to talk about both procedure and substance. Uh, I decided to talk first about procedure uh, because it's interesting uh, to give you a sort of an insider's view of how one conducts this kind of investigation on behalf of the President of the United States. Uh, and the, then the Gulf oil spill in particular, which had its own challenges. Uh, I think in this case, the procedure is no less interesting than the substance of it. Uh, and you actually can't really understand the substance of what we found unless you put it in its proper procedural context. Uh, now for the procedure, I'm going to try to do is give you a sense of the challenges that we faced at the President's uh, Commission uh, and the opportunities we had. Uh, as well, um, and then give you a sense of how we sought to meet those challenges and exploit uh, the opportunities. Uh, first, identifying the, the, the challenges. Uh, not surprisingly, the first presidential commission was created by the first president. Uh, George Washington created a presidential commission. Uh, it began because uh, the result of the Whiskey Rebellion, the Whiskey Insurrection uh, of 1790. Uh, the newly formed nation decided uh, that it wanted to tax uh, something to pay for the war debt. And they decided to tax domestic spirits, uh, and that caused a tremendous uh, rebellion in western uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the president called, created a commission of peace commissioners to come deal with the rebellion in western Pennsylvania, and the commissioners failed miserably. Uh, and he had to uh, put troops in uh, instead. Uh, it, it, to modern times, the first real presidential commission to investigate something uh, was Pearl Harbor. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor, uh, the president uh, created a presidential commission to investigate, uh, put a Supreme Court justice, uh, Owen Roberts, uh, as chairman. Uh, the commission, his charge was to look for derelictions of judgment uh, and errors, derelictions of duty and errors of judgment on the part of the Army uh, and the Navy. Uh, for my purposes, uh, I looked to the executive order to figure out what my challenges were. Uh, in particular, it's put right there. Uh, that, that's the first challenge I faced, uh, sort of what we were about. Uh, we were supposed to examine the relevant facts and circumstances uh, and identify the root causes, not the causes, but the root causes of the spill, and then develop options uh, for guarding against future spills and mitigating the consequences uh, of future spills as well. Now, why is this so challenging? Uh, First of all, it's really challenging because of this. It says right there, there's established a national commission of the BPD Water Horizon oil spill on offshore drilling. All right, that's it. Now, when the President of the United States and the White House makes me the executive director of the commission last June, uh, I'm now the executive director of the commission. But this is not like being made executive director of the FEC, uh, the Election Commission, or the FTC, the Trade Commission, or the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission. There's one major fundamental difference. When you're made executive director of this commission, the only thing that exists is you. There's nothing else. Uh, there's no staff. There's no building. There are no offices. There's no computer. There's no credit card. There's no piece of paper. There's no letterhead. There's nothing. You have an executive director of the president's commission. But that's it. Uh, so your challenge is you have to create it out of whole cloth. And you have to do it as quickly as possible. You have to actually create a commission, which actually doesn't exist, except for this line which says there's established the Oil Spill Commission. But the Oil Spill Commission is only one person at this point. They're commissioners. They're commissioners, seven commissioners, I'll introduce you to them. But they're not employees. Uh, their role is to approve the report. Their role is not to investigate, really, or to write the report. Their job is to approve the report. That's what gives it stature, is they approve it. But they're not a full-time employee. They have their own jobs. The only person who's a full-time employee is me and my research assistant for the summer from, uh, from Georgetown, where I was at the time, uh, because, who had signed on for a very different job uh, than this job. 
she became my only other employee. She just finished her first uh, year uh, of law school. Uh, the other challenge is the executive order says six months. Uh, that's how much time I have to, to examine the relevant facts and circumstances where we cause and develop options uh, for the future. Uh, now, six months is a really short period of time. 9-11, uh, about 24 months. Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, about 24 months. Weapons of Mass Destruction, these are all their presidential commissions, investigations, about 24 months. And they all got extensions of time. They couldn't meet their deadlines. Now, six months is very different than 24 months, and it's not just a, it's not, not just a multiple of four, because there's a certain startup time and a certain ending time. And that's the same whether you're 24 months or six months. So six months was very ambitious indeed. Uh, it's also ambitious because unlike the other commissions, we're being appointed, being created at the end of June 2010. And what's happening in June of 2010? There's oil coming out in uncontrolled fashion in the Gulf of Mexico. The crisis is not over. It's still going on. That's unlike all the other commissions. The other commissions are, we've had a disaster. It's done, right? That's Three Mile Island, done. Now have a presidential commission, which they did, go investigate. Or Space Challenger, it happens, it's done. 9-11, it happens, it's done. Our challenge is that it's not done yet. It's still going on. So the facts are not even in yet. And you don't have any repose, moment of reflection to sit back and try to figure out what's going on because it's going to take 87 days for the contained the well, July 15th, 2010. About six more weeks before they actually kill the well. That's all relevant to what we're doing. And if you compare what we had to do to these, our situation would have been like these if on April 20th, 2010, there had been an explosion on the Transocean rig. It had gone down. 11 people had died, and that was it. No oil had come out. That's Three Mile Island. That's Space Challenger. Explosion, end of case. That's not our case. Our case is explosion, 11 people tragically died, and oil is coming uncontrollably out. If we had oil uncontrollably coming out, we probably wouldn't have existed. It was uncontrollable oil. Now, that dramatically increases our job. Not just because the facts are still coming in, but also because if all we had to do was the explosion, like they had to do, your focus of inquiry is really narrow. All right, let's look at BP, Transocean, Halliburton. Let's look at the Macondo well. Let's look at the regulatory oversight of it. End of case. But because we have to deal with the spill and the failed containment efforts and the oil coming out and the response efforts, we now have to not just investigate what was then MMS, the Mineral Management Service Department of the Interior, and three parties. We also have to look at everyone who has anything to do with containment and everyone has anything to do with response. That takes me beceyond Department of the Interior to include the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency doing dispersants, the Navy who's got vessels burning the oil, the Coast Guard who's in charge of the response action, the Army Corps of Engineers who's responsible for the burn. As the oil spreads out, so does my jurisdiction. To the states, to the 47,000 vessels which are out there trying to clean it up, to the hundreds of thousands of people who are out there trying to clean it up, to the Department of Energy, the San Diego Lab, everyone who's trying to come up with some way to contain this oil, that's all about that I have to worry about, and the facts aren't even all in yet. That's hard, and I've got very limited time uh, to do it. Now that's what makes this a really tough job. You add to it, the fact is when they created this thing, look what they called it. The National Commission of the BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill and Offshore Drilling. They didn't just make us a commission just on the spill. They made us a commission on offshore drilling, which arguably gives the commission the charge to tell the nation what to do about offshore drilling, writ large. That's a huge issue to take into account. And words matter. I'm a lawyer. Words matter. Right? My assumption is a word is not there unless there's a reason for it to be there. 
And that potentially expands our jurisdiction and what we have to think about going forward. The other big challenge I had is, and this will not come as a surprise to anyone, it's a fairly highly politically charged time in this nation's history. <coughs> Uh, and politics uh, is everywhere. Everything's political. And the tendency of the media to do everything in a political way, to view everything through a political lens, even when it shouldn't be. There should be nothing political about a presidential fact-finding commission trying to find out what happened for that Gulf oil spill. Any more than it should be political when you have the Warren Commission, Chief Justice Earl Warren, trying to find out you know, how the President of the United States was assassinated. That should not be a political undertaking. That should not be a bipartisan undertaking. It should be a nonpartisan undertaking. But everything these days is viewed politically in the world we live in. And that affects the commission. So the commission is created. And the current model we have for these presidential commissions, right, these are my seven commissions. The current model we have is bipartisan, not nonpartisan. The old ones were nonpartisan. It's now bipartisan. You need a Democrat, you need a Republican. So there's a Democrat, Senator Bob Graham from Florida, former Senator, Governor of Florida. And Bill Riley is the Republican, former head of EPA under the George Bush uh, administration, George H.W. Bush uh, administration. And five distinguished people, academics, uh, politicians, uh, Francis Beinecke, head of NRDC, Don Bosch, University of Maryland president of the Sciences, Terry Garcia from National Geographic Society, Sherry Murray, uh, dean of the School of Engineering uh, from Harvard, and Fran Ulmer, former deputy governor uh, of Alaska, then chancellor from the University of Alaska. Alaska has offshore drilling in Alaska. That's why she's there. Uh, there's the commission. Now, but everything is through a political lens. I'm not justifying it, I'm explaining it. My challenge is executive director. Everything is a political lens. People are going to look at that, and what are they going to say? They're going to want, where are the Democrats, where are the Republicans? Where are the conservatives, where are the, where are the liberals? Where's the red, where's the blue? Where are the Republicans? Well, there's only one obvious Republican on the group, Bill Riley. Former president of the World Wildlife Fund. That's a pretty liberal Republican. Where are the people from industry? Where are the petroleum engineers? Where are the experts in industry? People are going to look at that and say, I don't see them. These are seven really smart, really able people. But people are going to look at this and say, you know, where's the petroleum engineer? Jerry Murray's an engineer. She's not a petroleum engineer. She's a physicist, but no petroleum engineering experience, no technical background. Very distinguished, very smart, but not strong. Noah from industry, Bill Riley, is on the board of Conoco Phillips. He resigned while he was on this. He's on the board. That's an industry. But he's more of the environmentalist on the board of Conoco Phillips. Very thoughtful, very distinguished. But industries will look at this and say, you know, I see a lot of what if I look at this. What color do I see? Well, we really see white. <laughs> <laughs> You see environmentalists. Um, Wall Street Journal, not surprisingly, responds. Why else gets drilled? How ideologically stacked is this commission? Immediately condemnation from the commission. And some in the business industry, which are very worried about this commission. And things are not helped when the White House announces the new executive director of the commission. All right? <coughs> Underscoring bias, the President's Commission has chosen prominent environmental litigator Richard J. Lazarus as its staff director. And one of my favorite lines from the Wall Street Journal editorial was this. I love that. <laughs> now the fact is, in my background, I'm a DOJ guy. I'm a Department of Justice guy. You give me a political position, I'll be political. You give me a non-political position, I won't be political. This is a non-political position as far as I'm concerned. This is like being a Department of Justice career lawyer. We're supposed to find out what happened, do a straight shot on it. Doesn't matter. President of the United States, he says, I don't have no fear. You tell me where the facts are, I want to know. The job is, this is 
sites of Pearl Harbor. You know, this point. There are our shores of our nation are being assaulted with uncontrolled amounts of oil. We don't didn't know then what we know now. This was an incredible crisis. The job is to find out where there were derelicts of judgment. Derelicts of duty and errors of judgment. And there's no reason to fictionalize it. Because if you fictionalize it for politics, it will happen again. So our job is to not to let that happen. But this makes my job hard, this kind of issue. The moratorium. Secretary of the Interior, the President, put a moratorium, hugely controversial moratorium, on deep water drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. Where did people look for relief from the moratorium? The Presidential Commission. That's not my job. My job is to make sure it doesn't happen again. Not to run the current oversight effort. But not surprising, when you are the Presidential Commission, the only Presidential Commission around with the spill, what people are, care about is jobs and the Gulf and the moratorium. They want to come to you for relief. It's very hard to get your job done when people are trying to get you to basically run the current crisis instead of make sure it doesn't happen again, which is what these retrospective things are supposed to do. But given politically charged times, the fact that crisis is still happening makes my job really hard. They sort of stay focused on what it is we're actually supposed uh, to be doing. Here's the upshot of that, of this kind of thing. In late June, the House of Representatives passes our budget. The President of the United States, when he creates this, says you get $15 million. He passed, the House passed our budget 423 to 1 in late June, giving us $15 million to do our work, our investigation, and subpoena power. Because of the politics of Washington, D.C., it never comes to a vote in the Senate. We never get one cent of appropriated funds from Congress. We never get subpoena authority, unlike all the comparable presidential commissions before. Things are too charged in Washington, D.C. Instead, what happens? Bills get introduced to create a national commission, right? A legislative branch one, because if people are unhappy about the makeup of the presidential one, they say, well, we'll create our own legislative national commission. That's really helpful to me. <laughs> I'm trying to create a commission to look at this, and now there's going to be another commission called the National Commission, and they're going to, and they probably say, we'll pass your budget if the President of the United States supports this one. We'll do two presidential commissions, one by Congress and one by the President of the United States. That one never passes. But it shows you sort of what happens. Uh, and this is in the midst of a you know, major uh, catastrophe. Other hindrances I have. The Federal Advisory <coughs> Committee Act. I am a FACA. I'm a President's Commission trying to investigate this huge thing with enormous potential civil and criminal liability. I am simultaneously a Federal Advisory Committee. That makes it hard to do an investigation because everything I do is supposed to be in public. So, we're all sworn in. And I say to the commissioners, I send them an email, I say, look, we're all getting sworn in on Tuesday. Uh, why don't those of you who are going to be in town come to my house for dinner that night? I think it'd be a good thing, get to know them, meet them, you know, build some bonds. It's a social thing to do. I immediately get told by the Office of Government Ethics, I cannot do that, that would be unlawful. Because that would be a meeting. If more than three commissioners are together, that's a meeting. And at the meeting, there has to be 60 to 30 days of notice of the Federal Register ahead of time, and the public has to be invited. <laughs> now, my view is that's wrong. But I'm not going to fight that battle. No, I'll pick my battle later on. But that tells you that if three or more commissioners are together at the meeting, you have to have notice of the Federal Register. All deliberations have to be in public. That's hard. I've got to get a document done in six months. I've got to have tough deliberation. I have to have fact finding. I have to have people come in and be willing to talk to me and not think everything they say goes to the public record. And now I'm also a federal advisory committee at the same time. That makes my job even harder still. So what did, I, what did we try to do about this? The first thing you do is you look back at the executive orders. Any good lawyer would do. You says it says within six months. But then you look at the executive order and you read 
read it even closer. And you say, aha. <laughs> it actually says six months of the commission's first meeting. All right. Now, any law student knows what to do with this. Right? If, if you said to me, right, you said, all right, uh, if I told you, uh, your paper is due to me two months after we meet. Can you meet this Friday? Oh, I'm really busy. It turns out I can't meet this Friday. <laughs> How about two months from this Friday? Uh, but not this Friday. It's pretty simple. As a matter of fact, you look to the past commissions, they generally met an average of two to three to four months after the commission was created. So they trigger their clock a little bit later. Perfectly sensible. When do you think we first met? I actually thought we should meet maybe in September. Meet in September, then I have time to get a staff together, get offices, get computers, get everything going, hire experts. Uh, six months from then, we'll be ambitious, March or April. All right, but let's have a meeting in September, now that it's like the end of June. When do you think we had our first meeting? What? No, no, first meeting? July 10th. Why? Other than, right? Massacres. Why? <laughs> because there's an ongoing crisis and our nation is being inflicted with oil and the American people want to see action. Oh, we're the Presidential Commission and we'll, we'll see you in September. We're disappearing until September. It's a disaster. Uh, we need to show we're there. We need to show we care. We need to show we're engaged. We need to show that the Gulf of Mexico, that we're out there and we're trying to figure this thing out. So we held a meeting, two days, nationally televised hearings for two days in New Orleans. I think it was July 10th to 11th, I mean 11th or 12th. I think it was 10th to 11th. And we held site visits with commissioners in all five Gulf states the two days before that. This is like nine days after we're created. I got no staff, I got nothing. But we had to do it. So we did it. You hire contractors as fast as you can. You put this thing on. One of my biggest worries at that point was someone, some intrepid reporter would come back to the headquarters of Washington, D.C. I now had offices. They come back with a camera, take a picture of the commission headquarters, and guess what they would have seen? Me and my research assistant, right? And a few other people. <laughs> Uh, because there's no time to staff up because we're actually having to hold these hearings rather than hiring people. So it's going to take longer to hire people. And by having the meeting, my clock is triggered. And I have six months from the date that we held uh, our, first, uh, our first thing. So what I had to do is I had to hire staff quickly. By about August 6th, I had a staff of 60. About two and a half weeks after the meeting, we had a staff of 60 people. <coughs> I put a premium on several things other than speed and hiring. And people who would come to this job, and I'd say to them, uh, you've had a summer plan for vacation? Forget it. And by the way, our six months is going to go right through Thanksgiving and New Year's and Christmas. Forget it. We had 60 people fairly quickly, but what I did is I hired no environmentalists. I had a lot of people raise their hand, wanted to come work for me. No one, any kind of preconceived agenda, no kind of people with big ideology, I didn't want. It's the presidential commission. I have a lot of friends in Brown Community, raise their hands and come, no, but hire. Because I couldn't afford to look like we were some sort of green thing. We shouldn't be. We should be rigorous, tough, with no, no agenda, no people who have been suing the oil companies and doing stuff in the past. That's not what we're doing. If you want to talk to us like anyone else, and you should talk to us because facts, that's fine. But you're not on the set. Uh, and I put a premium instead on hiring people who had strong reputation in the business community. I wanted to hire people who the oil and gas industry would look at and say, this commission's pretty good. This commission means business. So I hired, oh, here's the other reason I did it. I thought that the commission should have it because people in the industry are the first people to criticize when mistakes are made. When a mistake is made, this is the Baker Report, James Baker. <coughs> Internal investigation done a BP at the Texas City Refiners. Explosion. You want to see a harshly written report, look at the Baker Report. Because if people in business, when they see people in business make a mistake, they're really mad. Because they know what it means. They know what it means when people die. And 11 people die. 
they know what it means when a business and industry is shut down. They know what it means for the community, they know what it means for their, their business. They don't quarter that. They're unhappy about it. I wanted those people on my commission who have been expertise and that kind of stature credibility to criticize. <coughs> Again, not coming to preconceive, but ready to do it. So I hired immediately a chief scientist and a chief counsel. The chief scientist was Richard Sears, retired from Shell Oil, petroleum engineer for 30 years with Shell Oil. He's teaching at MIT, he's now at Stanford, from Houston, Texas. Lived in Houston almost all that time. One of the head engineers for Shell Oil, incredibly highly thought in the oil and gas industry. Complete straight shooter. He's my chief scientist. Did that with press releases called the National Newspaper. And I hired my chief lawyer, Fred Bartlett. Fred Bartlett is about 77 years old. He helicopters skis. Don't get an arm lesson that with Fred Bartlett. <laughs> Graduate West Point, civil engineering. Has his own law firm, Bartlett and Back. One of the best trial lawyer firms in the country, in Denver, Colorado. Fabulous firm. Bartlett was George Bush's trial lawyer in Bush v. Gore. Because James Baker wanted one of the best trial lawyers in the country, he hired Fred Bartlett. That's who I want. I want someone, no one's going to think that we're doing this. And so I want a tough as nail lawyer. He's represented the oil and gas industry. A lot of his former associates, you see managing partner Kirk Ellis, are now working in the oil and gas industry. He is as tough as they are. He was industry's investigator for the Piper Alpha rig explosion in the late 1980s when 186 people died on the rig. Widely credited for coming up with an explanation of what happened there. When I called Fred Bartlett up the phone and asked him if he worked for me as chief counsel, he said, about time you called me. <laughs> <laughs> Raised some eyebrows in the White House when they heard we were hiring Fred Barton. But I didn't consult with them. It's not their job. We're independent. We never consult with them. That's not my job. I'm charged by the president to get it right. Uh, and Fred Bartlett sends a message to everyone that in business and industry don't do Fred Bartlett. They fear Fred Bartlett. But they do Fred Bartlett. The straight shooter of a person. And a very tough boy. And that's what I needed. Uh, a tough lawyer who's a straight shooter to make clear we were here not on some policy thing. This is an investigation to find out what happened. Not to jump to conclusions, but to find out exactly uh, what happened. I also brought in Tyler Priest from the University of Houston School of Business. Uh, a celebrated historian of the oil and gas industry. Probably the most celebrated oil and gas historian in the country. Brought him in. Straight shooter, real scholar. I wanted to put what happened in historical perspective. So we brought in Tyler Priest, who's also a terrific writer. All right, so now we have a staff. It's like the first week of August. First week of August, and since we had our hearing, I guess the first day was, maybe, maybe it was July 12th. I can't remember what the exact day was. July, oh, we can figure it out. July 12th, Monday, July 12th, for the first hearing. Because of that, reporters do six months later than that, it's due, oh, it says the 11th, right? It should say July 12th. So it should say January 12th is when the President of the United States has to be handed his report. But my press people and my staff told me, actually, you can't hand the President of the United States a report on January 12th. You're going to have to give it to him on January 11th. That does not make me happy. I don't have very many days. I don't want to lose a day. They say, you can't give it to him on January 12th because that's the year anniversary of the Haitian earthquake. So you have to give it to the day before because the earthquake will completely overwhelm the news day. So I've lost a day. It's January 11th. So then, I, the first thing you do is you talk to GPO, Government Printing Office. Say, all right, Government Printing Office, by statute, I have to have you printed. For me to hand the President of the United States a report on January 11th, when you need it. And they say, you're going to have to give it to us by December 21st. <laughs> And what you give us on December 21st is camera ready, done, no changes, all graphics, all proofing, whole thing, camera ready, done. No back and forth, no putting the graphics in later, done, December 21st. Good news for Christmas, bad news for me. Now if you start working backwards, it's December 21st is my drop dead day. All right? 
That means I have to have consensus on the entire contents of the report by about December 10th. Through all the commissions. If I don't have it by then, I'm not going to get all the grouping done, all the stuff done, all the graphics, all the formatting. We want to need one fabulous report for December 10th. Now, if December 10th is when I have to have consensus on the entire content by the commissioners, that means I have to give the commissioners everything by December 1st. That's the drop dead date for when they're having everything. So we, so we got to negotiate this thing. We got to do this thing. We got a consensus on this stuff. The, nine, the three mile island commission, complete non consensus. They completely broke down. The Senate opinions, all of it, we want consensus. December 1st is the last possible day I can do it. Now that means I've got to tell my staff, I need all the chapters by November 15th. That's the last time I can have a chapter for me. The draft chapter. So I can go through it. We can do all kinds of fact checking on top of that. And that means you've got to be done by November 1st with your research investigation. We're starting August 6th. This is hard. I mean, this is really tough. And I sat down with our, our staff at the beginning of August and said, look, this is our timetable. This is crazy. This is unreasonable. There's no question. January 11th is unreasonable. But, and that means everything I say to you between now and January 11th is going to be unreasonable. Every deadline I give you is unreasonable. But that's our deadline. That's the law. Executive order. We're not changing it. It's jurisdictional. So when I give you an assignment, you have to give it to me by that date. Because if you don't, you're squeezing out something else and making something unreasonable even worse. It's not going to work. The deadline is the deadline is the deadline. That's it. If you aren't done by that date, don't talk to me. Don't give me anything. Because I'm going to be working on it as of that date. So outside my office was this big chart. Actually, it was two pages. Huge chart, which had every single part of the report, which we outlined in early August. Every single part of the report with deadlines on everything had to be done to get this done. When things had to be done one way or the other, what it look like, different drafts, recommendations, the chapters, the whole thing. It's all laid out by day on everything that had to happen. And we have parallel tracks. We have a team on the blog. We have a team on the continuum. We have a team on response. Team on restoration. Team on the future of offshore drilling. Everything has to happen simultaneously if we're actually going to get this thing done. Nothing follows anything else. So we have to have everything done. I want chapter one done right by the end of September. I want chapter two, I want chapter three. Things are going to have to come in in a certain order if we have any chance of doing this and getting these deadlines done uh, in time. We also had to hold hearings. Now, I'm an academic. My instinct is, someone gives me a research project, I would do what Victor might do. I'd say, thank you very much. I'm going to go to my office, close my door, I'll be back January 11th, I'll give you a report. But we can't do that. I'm not an academic, the executive director of the President's Commission. We have to hold hearings. We have to show the American people we're active. We have to show we're out there. We're having hearings, we're having cabinet officers, we're bringing DP, Halford, we're holding people in court, we're having public national talks. So every single month they go two days to televised hearings. And well, I have a team who's just in charge of that as well. And while we're doing this, we're producing staff papers. This is the first staff paper we put out. It was on the flow rates of the government and the fate of the oil by the government. And we came out and we criticized the government. We criticized the White House, we criticized the administration for failing to estimate the oil flow right and for failing to be candid. American people about the amount of oil coming out. This did not make people happy. That's our job. Not to not make people happy, but to give it straight. Tell the truth. Not very good press for doing so. We did the same on cement testing. We conducted a lot of cement testing of the cement used in the well here in Houston. Reported the results of cement testing done. Again, finding out facts that other people haven't found out by a particular team of lawyers and engineers doing uh, that work. And to stay honest, we met with the president in mid-November to give them a sense of what we were doing and what we were finding. But just a report, nothing in terms of what 
they say, and they, did, they kept hands off of us. And they were pretty unhappy with us at this moment. I don't think this guy was unhappy with us, but some of the other people probably weren't happy with us because we had criticized the White House in some of our staff papers. January 11, 2011, we hand the President of the United States the report. Now, how do we do it? I should tell you before I get to that, and that's the tip of the iceberg. There are actually three different reports being done there. The President's report, I'll we'll talk about the Chief Counsel's report to the Commission, uh, and the interactive website uh, as well, which is actually a terrific uh, website. Those are the staff working papers. <coughs> Commission's report is the primary product that we put out. Each one had a different audience. This one, the American people, Congress, policymakers. Highly accessible and easy read for people. Modeled in many ways after the 9-11 uh, report. Three parts. It's a narrative, it's a story. The path to the tragedy. What happened that day? History of offshore drilling. History of oversight. The explosion the aftermath, the detailed view of what actually happened the day of the explosion and right afterwards. And finally, lessons learned, recommendations for industry, for government, and for the future. But deliberately written in this very gripping style, here's the first chapter. Chapter one, every involved the job is satisfied. At 5.45 a.m. on Tuesday, right? April 20th, a Halliburton Spending Engineer sent an email, everything looks good. That is the first line of the report. And that tells you the kind of report it's going to be. Gripping, narrative, put you there, personalized, realize that people die, real people die on that grip. So they can make tough decisions at the time. Chapter 9 has full of recommendations directed to different kinds of entities. And chapter 10 is on the future of offshore drilling. Chapter 9 and chapter 10 have the toughest material for consensus. That's why they're chapter 9 and chapter 10. <laughs> I took them all out of the other chapters. I could get the other chapters through as quickly as possible, Commissioner, and backloaded the toughest battle. So that could happen in the Senate. We could get this stuff done. Chief Counsel's report. <coughs> This document. This is a report of the Chief Counsel to the Commissioners. So it doesn't have to be approved by the Commissioners. This is a report to them. Ms. Stomer to call it a Chief Counsel's report. It's a highly technical, detailed, factual, expert report. Because you only have about 30 or 40 pages for a Commissioner's report. This one does every single mistake, every single thing that happened on the radio. Every single thing. Highly technical, expert report. This report saves lives. Wholly apart from the Commission's report, this report saves lives. This report is being used in engineering departments, Department of Security, they order 100 copies of it. People in business, people in the oil and gas industry are not in the business of killing their employees. That's part of their family. If you show people what went wrong, they'll correct it. And so we want to show them what they did wrong. We want to show them the detail what went wrong. And the interactive media website you should look at it's a fabulous website. All the time you want to see how centralizers work, how drilling happens, all embedded, all wonderful graphics uh, going through. But how do we do all this in the time we have? First, a murderous schedule. Just unbearable schedule. Uh, a Rosa schedule, I could have said by December 5th, I didn't know we would be done. We could get it done. We just took a huge amount of work. We actually were a day early, January 11th, not January 12th. We actually spent $10 million, not $15 million. We had to get money from other places. We 
we said 10, not 15. How? Didn't pay ourselves very much. This is public service. Public service, you shouldn't pay. Fred Bartlett, how much do you think I paid Fred Bartlett an hour? $65 an hour. Another partner from his firm, a Supreme Court clerk for Justice O'Connor, another civil engineer, I paid him $55 an hour. Richard Sears, 30 years of experience at Shell Oil, paid him $75 an hour. Not even sure the people who bothered to build it. For them. Everyone was paid government rate, because this is a government job. And no one should be getting rich when you talk about doing something which is patriotic for the nation and public service. And no one got rich. Our trial graphics people, incredible company, cut rates. Everyone was willing to cut rates to do fabulous work in this particular uh, context. It just wasn't uh, an issue uh, that way. The other reason, how can we do it without subpoena power? We found out everything we needed to find out without subpoena power. How? A lot of that, Fred Bartlett. The walking subpoena. <laughs> But more than that, he is a very good lawyer and he's very trustworthy. There's a lot of integrity in the industry. And Fred Barber would say to the industry, he'd say, look, I'm the best deal you have. Everyone else out here is trying to sue you. I'm not trying to sue anyone. I'm not prosecuting anyone. My only job is to find out what happened so it doesn't happen again. You tell me straight. You give me the facts. I'll be fair with you. I have no agenda here but to get this right. And people trust me. He was very transparent and very honest with people in the industry. And they do it and they trust him. He said to them, I don't think you're making a wise judgment for your company here and not giving them this stuff. Go back and talk to your board of directors and tell them what's going on here. I really don't think you want me to hold a press conference and say on April 20, 2010, 11 Americans died, and whatever our company is not going to give the information I need to make sure it doesn't happen again. You don't want me to say that. And it works. It also works because industry was very cooperative. Most were very cooperative. There was a lot of finger pointing. A lot of different companies all wanted to point to somebody else. All coming and having private meetings with us, telling us, this is what happened. This is what happened. We got a lot of information that way uh, as well. But we like to get tremendous cooperation from industry. A little less cooperative when we started coming out with conclusions and findings. Uh, but we couldn't have done our job without Bartlett. We couldn't have done our job without industry uh, basically be willing to be cooperative with us. All right, so what did we find? First of all, the people surprised. We made it quite clear drilling deep water does not have to be abandoned. It can be done safely. Not that it's being done safely, but it can be done safely. It's not like, as though this is a technology which can't be done. It can it can't be done, and it can't be done safely. We surprised people by saying that. We also said it was nothing inherent in the well design. Everyone said the well design. Nothing inherent in the well design which made this happen. <coughs> Not well design some companies use, but there's nothing fundamentally flawed about, the, about BP's well design. It created certain kinds of risks, which then required some corresponding measures. But it wasn't like the well design. Instead, what we did was we identified a whole series of mistakes that were made. Mistakes by different companies, mistakes by government, which all contributed to this happening in terms of failure for risk management. The big thing when you're trying to do deep water drilling is you're trying to maintain equilibrium as you're going deeper and deeper and deeper. And these things are we're talking a mile from the surface, another two, three miles down below. I mean, it's, um, this technology is unbelievable. It's actually very cool what the oil and gas industry has done with enormous dividends to this country in terms of energy. But it's hard. When you start going down that deep, the pressures are tremendous. The tremendous pressure is good. It actually means you don't just take a lot of energy to bring that oil and gas up. Once you tap into it, it comes out quite naturally and quickly. That saves money. But it means when you're drilling down, you're, you're balancing this up. You put, get, put pressure in, enough pressure in that you stop the stuff from coming out, but not so much pressure in that you break the formation. If you break the formation, you have under control the release of oil and, and gas in the ocean. So you're trying to maintain your equilibrium very carefully as you go down. You have a whole series of techniques to do this. They spent billions and billions of dollars doing it. It's pretty amazing what they're able to do. But they made mistakes here. With cement. The cement has to be a certain weight. The cement has to be a certain place. It has to be centralized a certain way down. You screw up the cement, you may have a break. 
and a well water. And they made mistakes on the cement, on the stability of the cement. They made mistakes in the temporary band. One of the most challenging things you do is once you find the pay day, once you find pay dirt, you then got to cap off the well, walk away, get that incredibly expensive transocean rig away from there, and bring in the cheaper production rig when you want to when the market is right. But that means at some point you have to cap the thing off and go. It's called temporary abandonment. And they kept changing their plans. They kept changing when they were going to displace the seawater, how deep it was going to be, where the cement plug was going to be. Every few days, they're changing the plan. And there's no regulations over this. They keep changing the plan. This is an email we found on April 17th from a BP engineer. We're flying by the seat of our pants. Not exactly what you want on this kind of procedure. Three days before the level. There are all kinds of pressure tests which are done to make sure the well is secure. The equilibrium is set. It's not going to blow up. There was negative tests after negative tests showing a problem with well, showing a problem with well, and they ignored it. They explained it away. And the person who explained it away on the rig who said, "Don't worry about that. I think I know what this is. This is the bladder effect." He died. He didn't do that deliberately. He died for his mistake, as did his colleagues next to him for making that mistake. But there's a training issue. There's an oversight issue. There's a risk management issue. There are no protocols for negative pressure tests. There's no regulations in the Department of Interior for negative pressure tests. Although it's absolutely crucial that you are going to deeper and deeper drilling. This is what the Transocean employees are looking at when this is all happening. This is what their screen said. And guess what? There was a problem right there. Hard to spot, isn't it? They didn't spot it. Now, it wouldn't cost a lot of money to change things a little bit. The screens, but they've used these screens since decades ago. Change it. You know, get an Apple computer. Change it. When, when a certain kind of kick happens, maybe even a red light go blink. Blink, blink, blink. Uh, doesn't cost much. Buildings are being made, easy corrections. Just no, no thinking about risk management at the same time you're doing this. Huge amount being spent in one place, almost nothing in something else. Containment, no one actually had an idea how to contain this kind of well. It's actually not that hard if you plan ahead of time. Make the well a certain way, or a module set up, you contain it. But since no one did that, it took 87 days. By a lot of seed the pants. Again, lack of planning. Not impossible to do, but lack of planning ahead of time. So what did we find? And this is the most controversial thing we said. Everything else is not controversial. We then used the word systemic. We said this is a systemic problem. This isn't just a mistake by a couple employees, and it's not just a mistake by one company. The reason to think one company might be more prone than others. Not all companies are created equally. But we saw it was a systemic problem throughout the industry and throughout government overseeing industry, both sides of the equation. The kinds of mistakes being made, every, every one of the oil and gas companies said they, had, they could contain this well. That's what their papers all said for leasing. None of them could do it. None of them had the expertise. They all said they did. All of them said they had response actions efforts and resources. None of them did. The response technology had not advanced since the Exxon Valdez spill in 1990. No investment in that area. We're talking about BP, Halliburton, Transocean. Halliburton provides the cement for everybody except for Chevron. So they're all dependent upon Halliburton. Transocean is the largest rig operator. This is an industry which is now horizontally integrated at the point where everyone's dependent upon everyone else. We conclude a systemic problem, both in government and in industry, and in government, and oversight. The government had failed to keep up with this new risk associated with this area. Insufficient personnel, insufficient resource, insufficient expertise. The Gulf of Mexico is a huge resource of revenues, second only to the IRS. Billions of dollars of revenues. And every administration, Democrat and Republican, every single one, for the past several decades has been dining out on this. No one was doing the kind of oversight. The oversight is nothing compared to the revenues coming in. But everyone was dining out on the revenues and not worrying about uh, the risks. I should add, though, a little time I've got, 
The report isn't just criticism. <laughs> Chapter two is actually quite celebratory discussion of the history of oil and gas industry in the United States. This, by the way, is a great movie. You should see it. <laughs> the boil preventer, which fails in the movie, is by Cameron, the same company that produced the boil preventer for the BP bill in 1952. Chapter four singles out for praise Chevron, which deserved it. Chevron tested the cement for us. That was a selfless act by Chevron. They made no friends in the industry by willing to cooperate and test that cement. But it made the test, right, unimpeachable. It was an industry test. They have the best, the best cement labs here at Houston. And they did it. They did it in public service and the patriotic act. I'm sure they take a lot of flack for it. It was incredibly important. They deserve a lot of praise for what they did. Uh, BP. As much as we condemn BP throughout some of the others, BP stood up after this spill happened. One of the luckiest things we had happen for this spill was with BP. That was a major company. A minor company would declare bankruptcy a day later. We were nothing. Government couldn't contain this well, they know at least BP could. And BP for billions of dollars. They contained that well in 87 days. Now if they had good planning, you could have gotten a week. But they didn't have good planning. Without absolute planning, the fact they did it in 87 days in Herculean was incredible what those engineers did in those 87 days to try to figure out how to do this thing and save the Gulf of Mexico. It was an amazing job uh, that they did. And we singled that kind of stuff out. And the other oil and gas industries uh, helped uh, as well. We make it quite clear government can't do this, never can do it alone. Industry's going to have to do it with government, not government by itself. It's going to take industry self-policing in addition to the government. Uh, last thing I'll say if I close, if someone asks you to be executive director of the presidential commission, talk to me first. <laughs> uh, I'm very glad I did it. But if I had known everything that I knew three weeks after taking the job, I'm not sure I would have done it. If I had known I wasn't going to get my money, I knew I wasn't going to get by subpoena authority. I'm glad I did it. It succeeded, worked well, but it's not a good thing to do for your health. <laughs> but now it's the responsibility of industry and government. They now have to do something. Government is actually doing some stuff, industry is doing some stuff, Congress has not yet passed anything. And this is low hanging fruit in everyone's interest, including industry's interest. Easy, easy reforms, inexpensive reforms, worth billions of dollars in revenue, worth billions. Uh, hundreds of millions of gallons of petroleum that the nation needs from domestic uh, supplies. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize what happens if you fail to do adequate risk management. This bill does not appear to have been as disastrous as we once feared. We won't really know for the long term because we don't know the long term and the long term happens. But look to Japan. Look what happened. <coughs> This is we were finishing. Failure to do risk management. Easy stuff. Build the wall a little bit higher. Don't put the different engines that you need for coolant down below. Put them up. Cost nothing. But if you assume away the issues, you can have a true catastrophe. Thank you.